First of all, I would like to welcome our viewers to Greenleaf TV this week. We're going to be talking about uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and the situation in India um, and about um, the racism uh, of Australia's response to, to the crisis in India. And so we have um, some special guests with us today and I'd like to welcome to the program um, David Shoebridge and Mirash Khan and um, I'm Kamala Emanuel and I'm speaking to you from uh, Turbul and Jagra country um, and I'd like to just begin by acknowledging that we're um, each of us speaking from some part of occupied um, country of, of, um, of stolen land, Aboriginal country that was never ceded um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging. So, and I'd like to then just maybe just have a, a couple of words of, of introducing our guests. I'll start with um, Mirash Khan. Mirash, thanks very much for joining us. Um, Mirash is with the Humanism Project. Um, and maybe you'd like to just give us a, a couple of words about, um, about the Humanism Project and, and what you do. Sure, Kamala. Um, the Humanism Project is a collaborative effort to counter the growing hate and divisiveness agendas at work in India and overseas, and it is a collaborative effort of the Indian diaspora, and we are attempting to work with global Indians from various different backgrounds to reclaim the values of tolerance and secularism and inclusiveness, which essentially is the, is the core of um, the Indian culture. And um, along with um, you know, the three other co-founders, Deepa Karun and Jyotsna, um, we do have a really strong community um, they, from different organizations coming up together and trying to do different um, efforts to save and to uh, make sure there are, um, you know, some ground efforts happening. And because we're all over here in um, overseas, but there are things that we can do from here that people essentially from the Indian background living in India cannot do. So we are trying to be their voice. Second guest is, um, is David Shoebridge. David's a Greens Member of Parliament um, in the, the New South Wales Upper House. Um, David, welcome. Talking with us a, a bit about the Australian government's response to, um, to the crisis in India. But, but first, I'll, I'll just say a couple of words about it as well. It's just that, um, and firstly, again, to, to just acknowledge the degree of of, um, of pain and hardship that, that people in India are going through um, at this moment where uh, from the, the, the death toll just keeps on rising. So there, we're now sitting at more than 4,000 people dying each day, um, more than 400,000 new cases of COVID-19. Um, and, you know, I think the whole world has been just, you know, has, has been disheartened and, and, and shocked at the the scenes of, um, of hospitals in crisis, of people without oxygen, um, not enough facilities, um, even the crematoria running out of space. And, um, and clearly uh, the friends and families around the world have, have also been um, feeling the, the pain of this. Um, so in, in the midst of this pain, the Australian government's had a response. Do you want to talk about that a bit, David? Um, yeah, and, and thanks for um, having this discussion and, uh, and thanks to Mirage and Humanism Project for all the work they've been doing now um, for, for the better part of 12 months, um, addressing a, a number of deeply troubling issues arising um, in India that have, have concerned the diaspora, uh, the most recent being um, the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. And I just want to start by um, uh, um, acknowledging you know, just the, the scale of the humanitarian disaster we're seeing in India, um, the sheer number of people and families being torn apart and, um, and, and just how traumatic it is. And we were talking earlier today with a, a group of people from across the diaspora and speaking about um, their, their Facebook feed, just constantly filling with um, news of friends and family and connections um, 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 who have passed away and the bereavement and the grief that is rippling through um, the community is very real. Um, and, and uh, you know, what has been the, the Australian government's response? Well, I don't think you could describe it as anything other than um, grounded in, in some pretty appalling, um, I would say, effectively racism in how the response happens. Because if we cast our mind back over the last 12 months of the pandemic, um, 
we saw, you know, in the first six months or so of the pandemic, the areas that were being hit proportionally at a higher rate than we're seeing in India right now. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of the, the raw numbers, we um, at, at a, an incredibly distressingly high rate. Um, early on the pandemic, we knew less about the disease than we do now. We had less structures in place to meet the, the threat of the, um, the virus. Um, and that was happening in the UK and it was happening in Europe and it was happening in North America. Um, and um, at no point was it ever said that um, we would shut down um, the movement of Australian residents, Australian citizens and families from the UK and Europe and the United States to Australia. Those, those, those connections continued. There was a system in place to deal with it through the quarantine system. But then as soon as it became apparent, you know, roll on 12 months later, and the pandemic is having this appallingly destructive second wave in India. And suddenly, when it's not a European country, when it's not a North American country, um, suddenly it becomes a crime under the Morrison government to return from India because of the pandemic. Now, those politics that, that, I, that, that, that have played into that, I think um, I personally find it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wound on the, the, on, on the country. It's a blow against what what I think all of us were hoping for was a mature, engaged, multicultural Australia. And it's been very raw and real. Yeah. And Marish, would you like to comment? See, the reality is it is a very extraordinary time. We are all aware of it. Um, but the response that comes from a government needs to make us as an Indian community feel that we are a part of the system not being shunned off because we come from a certain part of the world. We are a very hardworking community. We contribute and we have contributed so much to the upliftment of this particular country. And we, we feel very privileged, but at the same time, when pandemic hits, you, you live here with a survival's, survival's guilt syndrome. You know, you can't do a lot for people personally, but our, our government, especially for the citizens and the permanent residents, I think there needs to be a name pathway given to people of hope, you know, um, at this stage where we have to a very great extent overcome COVID. This is the time when you open the doors for your residents and make them feel safe and secure, health health system uh, or you know, the benefits of a health system is the right of every citizen. Now people who are actually citizens of Australia but are in, stuck in India for certain reasons don't have those benefits from the government over there because they have let go of their particular uh, citizenship from that country. So they are not entitled to any health system over there or government grants or any sort of a support. And then from here, un, you know, there's no extension of support as well and there is no hope. Hence, this particular um, announcement that came in a couple of weeks ago was really devastating and has brought, brought, taken a big toll on mental health for people who are here on shore. And definitely uh, we are putting health at risk for people who are offshore and wanting to come back to their families because this is what they call home. Australia is their home. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think, Mala, yeah. I think that, that catch-22 situation is something that um, very few Australians are actually aware of. Um, we have Australian residents and uh, citizens in India who have been told by their government, you cannot return home. You, you, you've got Australian citizenship, you've got Australian PR, and you're, you are not allowed to return home. And therefore, obviously, the Australian government is providing no income support. Um, many people have lost their jobs. Yep. Um, um, and also the Australian government is providing no vaccinations and no health support because they're in India. And on the flip side, in India, the Indian government is saying, well, you, you're no longer an Indian citizen. Um, you don't have an Indian ID card. You're not on our vaccination list. We're not providing the support to you because you're an Australian citizen. So, so in actual fact, there are Australian citizens and residents in India who are in a worse situation and have even less support um, than if they had the very basic support being provided by the Indian government. Um, 
And, and that, I think, is an unfairness that, that not many Australians have got their head around, um, that, our, that our, our citizens, our permanent residents, people who call Australia home, are actually some of the most marginalised in India because of a decision of their own government, of the Australian government. Yes. And and in in response to this, there have been at, at some of the the government's press at some of the press conferences with um, figures from the government. They have been asked, um, well, what about providing vaccination to through the the um, the high commission or or um, you know diplomatic missions or whatever kind, and they've simply come back with saying, oh, it would be logistically difficult. Do you think? you know, a year into a pandemic, months and months into the availability of vaccines, it's um, it's enough, it's it's good enough to say, oh, it would be difficult. Obviously, it is a logistical concern for people, um, the government, but it's not impossible. The number that we are looking at is certainly doable. However, the way it is projected to us, it looks like it's an impossible task, which is which we all know it's not. There have been in the past 12 months, we have seen countries who have been on a real high surge, um, but none of those people coming from the West ever faced such a strong ban. Yes, they're talking about some repatriation flights happening. However, not enough to accommodate and make the citizens back feel safe. They were saying something like three repatriation <laughs> flights. The last number I heard was two, two repatriation flights. And um, that's for people who are COVID safe, who are able to go along. However, um, um, this morning, since um, we had a really strong uh, press conference this morning as well, and they mentioned that there is a possibility, to, there is a need to have both positives and the you know safe people to bring into this community obviously take those strong quarantine measures to make sure that the society over here the community over here is safe but we are talking about two weeks we're not talking about long extended months so it is definitely possible but i think the the heart of the government needs to be in the right place to make these decisions in terms of those sheer numbers though um terms of the number of australians in india um, before the pandemic, um, when there were issues concerning Australians in India, the High Commission was talking about there being in the order of three, four, five thousand Australians in India. I mean, I think probably that is an undercount. Um, it's probably, you know, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 20,000. Um, um, you know, a significant number of people with real connections back to Australia. But the idea that it's logistically impossible to to provide vaccinations, 20,000 Australians in India, taking it at the highest sort of level, is, um, is just plainly, plainly false. I mean, India itself, a country with far less resources than Australia, um, repatriated 6 million Indians back to India at the commencement of the, in the, in the first half of the pandemic. And, and we've got a government saying that they can't provide services to, you know, maybe 10, maybe 20,000 Australians in, in, in India. Um, it's plainly untrue. It's of political priorities and political will. I, I guess in a way to sort of segue from uh, Australians in India being vaccinated is the question of could the scale of the problem in India have been less, the, that humanitarian crisis that's being experienced in India, could that potentially have been less if it had been possible to roll out vaccines sooner, which certainly in the global south as a whole there's, there's been a, a calls and demand for the waiving of intellectual property rights to make that possible. Mirage, your thoughts? Kamala, see, it, it would be fair to say that um, the um, health infrastructure back in India is completely collapsed. Health workers are stretched. Even COVID testing tastes, um, takes more than a few days to get tested. You know, people are dying on the stretches, waiting to be seen by a doctor. I personally have six family members admitted in the hospital, lost my uncle last week on Monday, a friend prior to that, the week prior. So constantly there is, you know, heartbreaking news that we are watching. What, what people back home, especially the citizens and the permanent resident need to know that we do have a plan. We have a plan for you, a proper dialogue, a proper press release saying, yes, this is your action plan. These are the steps you need to take back home. These are the steps we will take when you, we are, when you are here. And it's as simple as that. 
it's not a Hercules task which cannot be done. Obviously, you know, compared to the global governments, um, Australia has done a brilliant job, but making a certain part of the community feel not welcomed at a time when, you know, things are becoming hunky-dory over here, you know, get, things are getting back to normal. Not at this time, I don't think there was need to take such a drastic step. Um, Kamali, you, you heard just from that brief history from Raj, but how this is reaching into everybody's family in the diaspora here. And, and, um, and surely it would be enough for, for any family, for any individual to have to be coping with that level of personal trauma and family, family loss, but then also to have your government say, actually, because of where you come from, because of where your family is from, we're actually going to make it a crime for you to return home or for you to go over and see your family and be with them in a time of crisis. We will, we will, we will exclude you from coming back to your home. Um, it's um, the, the sense of betrayal, um, I think, is very real. And, and you can see why it's real because um, it really does strike at this concept, oh, you know, I'll, you know, we've heard it be said before, you know, apparently we're all in this together. Well, we're all in this together, but it seems some of us have got crappier set of rules applied to us based upon potentially the colour of our skin and our cultural history. And, um, and, and you couldn't help but have a sense of betrayal in those circumstances. Absolutely. Some people who have been interviewed on, on some of the corporate and public media seem to have been a little reluctant to call this racism. And I, I don't know whether that's just for um, the nervousness that, that can come with actually taking a stand and saying, yeah, that's actually what it is. But uh, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that if something predominantly affects a group of people who have been racialized um, or who do belong to a, a particular ethnic or language group, we've got to say that that's, that's a racist thing. And, and particularly when we've got the contrast that both of you have mentioned from, um, you know, well, when it was Europeans being predominantly affected, this didn't happen. I mean, really, is it, there's not really anything else that it, it can be called. And, um, and I think we're probably all looking with interest to see what happens out of the case that's, I think, being heard this afternoon, Monday, on um, in the federal court, the, the, um, someone's challenging... Uh, challenging the government's right to even make this um, yes. make this ruling that 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 it's possible for them to say, oh, it's a crime for some people to return to the country. It, it's a um, it's a kind of interesting moment for the legal system to work out whether or not your your rights um, and the government's obligations towards you under the Citizenship Act um, um, are just ignored um, and 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 put in the bottom shirt, put, put, bottom drawer if there's an order being made under the public health and quarantine laws. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the courts, but ultimately it's, it's ultimately a political question. And, um, and I think what I give credit to is the, the unified position from the Indian diaspora here in Australia, um, backed up, I think, by, by, by voices, you know, principled voices in the broader community as well, saying, pushing back on the government, and I think the government initially thought this may have been a very popular move um, in their eyes um, with middle Australia to keep us all safe and take a hard, hard line. But the, um, the united position from the diaspora, the strong articulate voices we've heard come out and name it for what it is, I give credit to them. It's been a, um, and I think it's been, it's, it's built their political strength at a time when you shouldn't have to be doing this. It's a time when you should be looking to your government for Support, not to challenge them, but they have the diaspora has challenged the government very effectively. That's been clear in the backpedalling that they've been doing. That they probably thought that if they put it out in a midnight media release, either no one was going to notice or anyone who did was going to think, yeah, you know, protecting the borders um, so, in, in the usual way. Yeah. See, in contrast, um, the Indian government has proved to be pretty clueless. They had one year to organize themselves. Millions of dollars have been collected, but there is no, nothing to show in terms of you know, health infrastructure or accountability. There is um, this massive billions of dollars collected in prime minister funds, but you know, um, there is no accountability. <laughs> People on shore are asking, there is not, to be honest, Kamala, we have seen ministers, premiers over here in Australia taking media questions 
um, and challenging um, their position and expressing how they are mitigating the risk overall every day on a daily basis. You see people coming in and sharing. How many times have we seen the Prime Minister of India actually um, come on a media release and talk about the health infrastructure over there? Has he ever addressed a media release? Never, not in the seven years, not in the past seven years. So unlike the Australian Prime Minister and other straight premiers who stood up and took questions from media in tough times and gave daily updates on what's being done, nobody knows <laughs> what's, what's happening with the system over there. Every, I, I recently, just yesterday, I actually saw one of the ruling parties, um, member of parliament, talking about um, ridiculous measures like taking cow urine and drinking it for two weeks at a row, that's going to save you from COVID. So we are, we are up against a completely ridiculous, unscientific, unorganized government over there. And when we look at hope, where we've let go of all of that, we've left our family, we've come here, and we have established ourselves, invested our family taxes, emotions, and positions anchored our lives over here, the government from here is, you know, showing a similar sort of a um, return. That's, that's not, not, um, not fair, pretty much not fair. And I, I think that um, there has really been this sort of global phenomenon that I think you're alluding to with um with Modi failing to to front up and and with um, ministers or uh, um, members of parliament from from his party uh, coming up with um, unorthodox, unscientific, untested. That's similar to like Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump when he was there in the U.S. Duterte perhaps to some extent. And I think the the um, in common there seems to be a a, a lack of of, of genuine concern for citizens and and for genuine measures to to prevent you know disease and death even if we are looking at past couple of weeks we've seen the ruling party of india conducting election um protests in you know the massive rallies they are allowing um religious festivals to happen both hindu muslim all sorts of culturally, they are gathering together. How can they allow this to go on? Not at this time when we are talking about a second wave and there are talks that there could be a third wave coming beyond June. So it's it's ridiculous to um, for us to see it from a global stage mm. and not question the way they are conducting themselves on ground. I think the, the inability of the, the global media, particularly the media in the West, to actually... Um, effectively critique the performance of the Indian government in response to this absolute crisis and, and to, to actually even just see the, the very easily identifiable parallels between the anti-scientific, populist, um, um, aggressively, you know, reject the view of the experts position being adopted by the Indian government and, and that you, you could just run a a ruler over the almost identical parallels with what Trump did in the United States. Absolutely. You know, all this nonsense about treating with sunlight and bleach, you know, yeah. there's similar, slightly distinct, but similar kind of nonsense being peddled by senior members of the BJP. Yeah. Um, we have massive electoral election rallies where they reject the concept of masks, sort of treating this whole thing as sort of, you know, an exaggeration and almost a, a sort of left-wing conspiracy. Um, you know, putting electioneering before the public health of the, um, the people they're, they're meant to be representing. I mean, the parallels between Trump and Modi um, are very real. And, and, and in terms of the health and welfare of the Indian people, really troubling. And the voice of dissent back home. Anyone who stands up and talks against the government are jailed under draconian laws um, and terrorism laws, and they are put behind bars so that they can't have, they are getting um, heavily censored. They are, they are being, their voices are being quietened and their families are suffering because of that. There are hundreds of cases we can take out of people who are actually standing in dissent and talking against and making the world aware of the atrocities that are going back home. You know, it's, it's, it's um, 
as it is, it would have been very tough for any government to deal with such a massive um, uh, pandemic. But the government um, has unfortunately displayed their utter incompetence. Yeah. And are proud of it. <laughs> and are proud of it. Senior ministers in the last 48 hours engaged PR, been engaged in PR exercises, sitting down and meeting with PR experts Absolutely. as to how to sell the outcome, rather than meeting with medical experts about how to change it. So I just wanted to wind back a little bit to, to the question of, um, so we're talking about how um, how the Modi government has has let it get to this, but it, but it also to just, um, I guess, the, the question, uh, kind of a, a step back from that of... of um, the, what some people are referring to as vaccine imperialism, where um, where the instead of instead of uh, saying, well, we've got we're going to have a global project to make sure everyone gets vaccinated. We've got Covax. We're going to have um, you know a World Health Organization led program so that everyone who needs it can have access to to vaccinations. Instead, you've seen the um, the richest countries take the lion's share of, of available vaccines, um, leaving the poorest countries without access to vaccines, while at the same time saying to poor countries with manufacturing capacity, yeah, but you still can't have the um, uh, you still can't have a patent-free access to um, to vaccines to produce. Um, thoughts on that, um, Mirash? It's horrendous to imagine how how the act of the government back home is affecting people who don't who are not citizens all right obviously we are concerned firstly on the citizens who are there back home plus the permanent residents but if we look at the humanitarian side of you know um, the pandemic there are so many aids that are being sent to India they're all rotting there in the airports without being dispatched to the right resources because of some government clearance that they are looking at. Instead of getting it out, there is no accountability again. We are sending aids, which is amazing, but it's not reaching those people. There needs to be a platform of tracking and accountability, both from here and there. People who are receiving it need to report it back. And when it comes to, you know, um, vaccines and how many people are developing such vaccines at the moment? You know, there are, it, it, as, as a layman, I can't keep a track of it. I can't. And there, there's this new double variant named B.1.617 B. that has devastating um, effects on the current population over there. So every day it's increasing. Every day the risk is increasing. Every day there are, there are lives that are lost. How long are we going to wait till we bring our people back home? David, what do you, uh, if you'd like to respond to that and perhaps also to, um, to just the fact that the government has had over a year to get sufficient quarantine facilities up and running so that they wouldn't have to be saying, oh, but, you know, we, we, had, we had 70 cases of, of COVID come in from, you know, passengers from India, so, so therefore, you know, the sky fell in and, and we had to, to stop citizens from returning. Yeah. Where, where should we be up to with, with quarantine facilities? Well, well, India, with a far less resources per capita than Australia, is, cope, is, is, is dealing with a crisis of, you know, three high 300s, um, thousands of, of at least identified infections on a given, given day. Um, and it's likely it's significantly more than that because of underreporting. Um, and, and message management. I mean, that's the, that's the massaged message coming from the BJP government, which is so distressing, isn't it? Hmm. Um, and Australia is saying that we can't come up with a system with all of our advantages, um, you know, a public health system that has not been swamped by COVID, um, um, one of the wealthiest per capita countries on the planet, um, perhaps the most, one of the most um, comprehensive um, um, public health systems across the entire country run by the Commonwealth government in the form of Medicare. And we can't come up with a quarantine system to deal with, um, you know, one, two, 3,000 people a week. It just does not make sense. And, and you can't help but feel that 
what we've seen with the um, travel ban from Indi on India is the Indian Indian Australians, the Indian diaspora, paying the price of the Commonwealth government's complete incompetence and failure to deal with it like it's a crisis, resource it like it's a crisis, and actually do their job. Because surely if there's one level of government that is responsible for quarantine, which is the interface, the biological interface between our country as a whole and the rest of the world, well, that's actually not the New South Wales government. It's not the Tasmanian government. It's not the ACT government. The government that has responsibility for that interface is the Commonwealth government. And they have not built a single facility and they have not stepped up and accepted their responsibility. And I, I just, I find that, you know, um, just that comprehensive failure from the Commonwealth government. And who's paying the price right now? Well, we know who's paying the price right now. Um, you know, the, the Indian diaspora um, are paying the price for the Morrison government's incompetence. And, um, you know, it is, um, it's, it's, it's awful to see. Uh, I think you asked me a second question, Kamala, but I got taken on that journey. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, uh, and, and just, just I, I guess as a, a comment to, to follow up on what you've just said is, um, you know, we're expecting the budget tomorrow and um, that would be a perfect opportunity for the federal government to, um, to make good its many, many failures and, um, and put a whole lot of money into creating a whole pile of um, quarantine facilities. And, and also, I, I guess, thinking about the, the importance that I, I think has... I think maybe one of you spoke about, but I think bears repeating that it's not only people without COVID who should have the right to return, that it's people with COVID should have the right to return. And I think obviously people who are working in the airline industry didn't necessarily sign up to be healthcare workers. Um, and so, um, so that needs to be done in a safe way, whether it's, um, whether it's with, um, you know, specific flights with a whole lot of medical personnel or or whether it's just you know very good training and very high quality um uh air filtration and and ppe and and the whole work so it has i mean clearly has to be done in a safe way but um if they're going to have a lot of spending in the budget perhaps um well not perhaps like really and truly they should be putting money into bringing people home safely kamala can I just on that point um it's a question of priorities and the, 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 the pandemic and the response to the pandemic, I think is front and center of Australians' minds. Um, and I think it's almost certain, it's almost certainly gonna be the case that the, in, the, in the upcoming federal budget, there will be more money set aside to, to slightly reduce the congestion at a single intersection of the M5 in Sydney than there will be in putting money on the table to help Indian Australians come home and have their families re reunited. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that a kind of jarring, a jarring concept and, and, it, and it exemplifies their priorities. That totally puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Um, a, a similar thing if they, they were able to spend more than a billion dollars, I think, on, on um, propping up the aviation industry in the past year. Um, surely some of that should have been tied to sufficient affordable flights home. Mirage, have you got a, a sense of, of um, the impact of, of the cost of flights on, on people trying to return home, you know, when it's, when it's open up again? It's dramatic for people to imagine to come back home and, and afford each, each ticket. One person is paying more than around between $2,500 to $3,000. And then additionally, charges for making sure that they are quarantined properly. All of that, on top of, you know, dealing with pandemic back home and supporting families onshore and offshore, you know, completely in, shredded in pieces. People, people are facing massive mental health problems at this stage. They are depressed. They are anxious. They are um, families are broken apart. They are, you know, obviously it's an extraordinary time, but it's unfair partner visa processing time. That's Another thing that I wanted to raise: there are there are people who are living away from each other. Between you know, it's been eighteen months. A friend of mine, she's been staying away from her partner, and and there is no hope at this stage for her to see her partner. She's not working here, but her partner is. However, he's paying the rent. Over here, he's got to come back while she is just given you know to a baby. She's looking after two other children. There are hundreds of stories that will come out of this on the other side when we look behind 
it will be really, really, be devastation. I mean, it's hard to convey the full depth of the trauma and chaos and the indignity that people are being subjected to at the moment. Um, what we are witnessing every day is, is, is crime, crime against humanity. On 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 um, on the Indian front, there are obviously, you know, there it is crime against humanity. Every every ruling government, every person responsible in the government has blood on their hands because um, everyone is suffering their mental nightmare. Whereas, you know, um, what least we can do is look after our citizens and bring them back home, and make sure that they are looked after. A country that deals successfully with a threat like COVID and it needs to be the one that pours out resources and you know make sure that vaccines are available. But um, you know, um, at this stage, what we are seeing is they are closing doors and, and making us feel like second-class citizens, which we are not. And David, I know you have to go. Have you any final comments you wanted to to contribute? Well, look, I, I think I suppose I want to look forward, what, what we should be expecting from the government looking forward. Um, the Morrison government has said they may do one or two rep repatriation flights a week out of India. Now, we know that's not going to be anywhere near sufficient, um, and we should be demanding a, a very firm time frame that every, every, every Australian, every permanent resident in India will be guaranteed to be brought home within one or two months and nobody should be waiting longer than that. And they should be made a, an ongoing promise that this won't be repeated, that if people go home to look after loved ones, if they go back to India and look after loved ones, um, that there will be a pathway back to Australia because everybody is entitled to look after their family and everybody should be entitled to um, go and provide the help and the succour and the sustenance that's needed for their family and their loved ones, particularly at a time of crisis like this. And I think we should also be demanding that, um, that there be repatriation flights and appropriate health facilities provided for, for those who have got, um, are, are actually positive and test positive for COVID. And, and, and we commit to providing that safe transport, and we commit to providing um, onshore healthcare here um, for, 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 for our citizens and our permanent residents, regardless of whether they're um, COVID-19 positive or not. Um, and, and I think these should be not negotiable. And, and in the meantime, um, we've got a budget coming and um, there should be free quarantine. Um, that should not come at a cost um, to, to, to somebody from, because, Everybody sitting in quarantine is not providing a benefit necessarily to themselves. They are providing a benefit to every other Australian um, by ensuring our public health is, is secure. And it should be a collective contribution towards that public health outcome. It is grossly unfair that it's been met so disproportionately by people who you know, are, are sometimes le least able to meet those costs. And I'd say the same for the repatriation costs. Um, um, you have a right to come home if you're an Australian citizen. And at the moment, that right seems very qualified. And thank you so much for, for participating with us this afternoon, David. Um, My pleasure. Marish, lovely to see you again. Kamala, good to speak. Thank you. Yeah, bye. bye. And Mirash, any final comments that, that you wanted to make about what we should be expecting in the coming weeks? See, Kamala, What's happening back home obviously is very, very uh, hard for people to imagine. Nobody has looked at this time last year and thought it going to be worse. Um, so I think people back home who deserve to be here in their country need to feel that the government of which cares, there needs to be a dialogue. They need to know that we care and they need to know that we do have a plan to bring them back home. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And look, thank you so much for, for spending time with us uh, this afternoon. And, and um, uh, really, I don't, I, I wish I had words to, um, to really convey, because I, I know it's a real struggle for yourself and, and for people you're talking with and for, you know, from people for, from the Indian diaspora here in Australia and around the world. And, um, uh, yeah, just, it just, uh, it feels kind of trite to even try to put something into words, but um, but can you just sort of read in this space um, an expression of, of solidarity and, and compassion and, and um, just a recognition of, of the, the hard times that you're going through? Um, 
uh, and I, I think, um, yeah, on that note, I will, we'll wind up. And just uh, to, our, to people who are watching, um, thanks for spending time with us. Um, if you like our work, we're Green Left Weekly. Um, if you like our work, um, please consider making a, um, uh, supporting us um, uh, because every, every bit that you contribute helps us to, um, to keep publishing um, on our, our videos and on our website. Um, and, uh, and I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot that we should be demanding from our federal government um, in terms of a response that puts people um, before the profits on the one hand of the, um, of the big pharma industry um, and and on the other, you know, they're, they're willing to, I just keep on thinking about this, they're willing to spend uh, money on, you know, this what they're calling a gas-led recovery. What about if they, they think of the actual physical, um, emotional, mental health and um, and social recovery that, that we need as a society? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again for your time. Thanks, Kamala. Okay. Cheers. Bye then.